Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University, and so much more, and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. And we have today fellow name shared <laughs> Robert with us today. But Robert, before we kick off, are you prepared to engage? Only because you said so. <laughs> So Robert Raymond Riopel, Riopel, how, how do you pronounce that oh, one? You got it on the second one, Riopel. Riopel. He is an international best-selling author, app designer, entrepreneur, and trainer who has spent the past 18 plus years traveling around the world. Of course, maybe not so much in the past few years, but he's been around the world sharing his passion. He has also shared the stage and trained with and trained many of the top trainers and thought leaders in the world today. And with his high energy and heartfelt style, he draws on his journey from humble beginnings to financial freedom at 32, when he's been inspiring individuals into tapping into their greatness. Realizing that he's not the only person who struggles, his clues are opening up individuals into the possibilities that lie within them. And that is why he is a highly sought after presenter. And that is why definitely we have him with us today. So Robert, is there anything I'm missing or maybe th something that you want to mention before we kick off? Uh, you know, I think you pretty much got it on I'm right on the button. But one of the things I do like to say is I believe there's way too many serious people on this planet. So one of my <laughs> goals is to make sure I add some light to people's lives and uh, so that they can learn to kind of have fun as, as along this beautiful journey. <laughs> and we will definitely be getting into that as far as this interview. But before we do that, well, or actually we can start there. What does a typical day with you look like or a regular day, however you want to call it? And I know you've, we were talking in the pre-interview chat, you've had like 160 something interviews in the past six months. So many things happen in between, but what, what would that look like? If it were to be you, what would that feel to be Robert in a day like that? Yeah. Well, and one of the things I'm going to let you know is it depends on the day. And here's what I mean by that. One of the things I'm a huge believer in is when I take out my phone and my wife and I go to do our calendar and our schedule, because I live by my schedule nowadays. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but in wealth, when they're talking about money, they always say wealth rule number one is to pay yourself first. And I totally agree with that myself, because that's how you create wealth. That's what I teach people around the world. But my question is, if you're going to do that with money, why wouldn't you pay yourself first with your time as well? And that's a big one for me. So when we do our calendar, the first thing we do is we put what we call our balance pieces or our pamper pieces on there, Rob, where we put in time together, time for each other, for our health, or just to read or to rejuvenate ourselves because you cannot give what you don't have. And so there's some days where my entire day is on the calendar as a freedom day, which means on that day, I can stay in bed all day if I want and watch movies all day, read books, whatever I want to do. There's no schedule to it because that's the part where it's taking care of me. So that a freedom day is just a day of just relaxation. If I'm doing a, what I call an energy day, then I usually start off anywhere as early because I have students and clients all over the world. I can start off as early as 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. for my start because of the time zone changes. And I can put in an 18-hour day and I like to group my busy days together. And here's the thing, with your reaction, because I have my, I like my time off, I really do. So because I have those freedom pieces in there, putting in an 18 hour day, am I tired at the end of the day? Yes. But because it's been a productive day, I got so much accomplished that I can take two, three days off in a row if I want, because of how I set it up, if that makes sense. Huh. So it's sort of supercharging a single day or a couple of days or whatever that looks like. Here's my big belief. When I'm with family, I want to be there, present, 100%. Not only physically where my mental and emotional is like, oh, what's going on? What do I need to do in my upcoming interview? Oh my God, what did I get this done? And because have you, Rob, ever been in a conversation with someone where, yeah, they're there physically, but you can tell their minds a million miles away while they're having that, a conversation with you? Of course. Yeah. 
And so one of my focuses is how can I be present the most during the day as I can? And that's what I've found has worked for me. So on that calendar, there's all those pamper pieces. And then the second thing I put in is what's called focus time. Because if you look at all the science and all the research, yeah, people can stay focused for around four hours, but they can truly only stay focused, really focused for about an hour at a time. And so I will put on in my calendar after I've taken care of me and my family, our time together, I will put in specific times where it's like, say, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. That's writing my book. And so when I come in my office and I know during that time, that's all I'm doing. No other distractions, no social media, no emails, no instant messages. I focus on solely on writing my book. In that hour, I can actually be as productive in one hour as maybe six hours of being busy with distractions. And one of the things I hear from students all over the world is, Robert, I don't have time. I'm so busy with my family and my (laughs) job or business. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably really good at being busy, but are you actually being productive? And so I'm really good at helping people free up time in their life by showing them how if you take those pamper times and then you take the productivity times, you can actually have a lot more time to do whatever the heck you want in and around that. Hmm. There you go. So that looks like there are many, many ways to start your days, but they are also pretty clearly defined beforehand. It reminds me of a conversation probably heard of him of this uh, near al wrote the book indistractable oh no i haven't i'll have to check mm. that one out indistractable. probably going to be interesting research for you i think he is episode he could be episode 100 actually uh it was right when he was uh, sending out the book for pretty recently and if you want to check it out it's it's a, the good thing about podcasts as you probably know is that you can be doing many other things at a time and you can still be paying attention to what's going on in your ears so oh, that absolutely. could be a first approach <laughs> he has a podcast as well by the way that and could what was be it a good near n-i-r yep a-l e-y-a-l and i'll check it out on your podcast i'll listen to that one i <laughs> that would be very interesting for sure I'm sure because he was also a fantastic guest, as you are as well, Robert. So let's cut to the chase. Oh, what now would you put you say, the pressure on me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say, Robert, is one of those times when you were, you know, you were going north and things went south or, you know, one of those <laughs> favorites maybe fails or first attempts in learning, especially it ha- if it has to do with creating fun or introducing fun into people's lives or, you know, games or gamification, which is part of the main topics we discuss in the podcast. If I made you that question, what would that look like for you? Yeah, you know, when you're going through the criteria, I'm going, I think I have one that covers all of the above. (laughs) And it's actually because I'm a big believer, the trainings I do are, they are what's called accelerated learning. So it utilizes gamification in all the trainings, high impact, high involvement with the students, stuff like that. And there you go. when I was getting ready to write my first book, I decided to create an app that is basically my book in app format, in which is full of creating mm. vision boards. And we are going to gamify it where, we, you know, as you do the different things, you're earning points. And then the points can then be exchanged for different things like either the swag um, with the branding or time to have a one-on-one conversation with me for coaching. So really inspiring people to actually do what's in the app and, and be on it as much as possible. And I remember it was on a Sunday, my wife and I are driving from where we live. We we're on a two hour drive to go visit family. And all of a sudden the phone rings and I pick it up on the vehicle and, and it happens to be a person who had invested with my app development right off the bat. And he happens to also be a brilliant, brilliant programmer. He is just like, the guy is insanely intelligent. And I'm like, hey, Jason, what's going on? And he goes, I'm sorry for calling you on a Sunday. And he is also a former student. And I'm like, why? What's going on? He said, something's been bugging me about the way the development of the app's been going with our development company that you hired. He said, so last night, I downloaded a virus off the internet And in 20 minutes, I was able to absolutely hack our entire system. (laughs) And now, thank goodness, you know, he said, and if you you can, he said, have Roxanne, which is my wife, he said, have her go on her phone and open up, um, try to log in because we hadn't launched yet. So we had no database, nobody in it, thank God. And so she opened up the phone and as soon as she logged in, a big pop-up window came and went, gotcha because he had programmed it to do that to prove his point that he had actually gotten in and been able to do it. 
And so my first reaction, because then he's kind of bracing for, for, for me to be really upset, is I, my first reaction was, first of all, thank you. And second, why are you stressed out about phoning me on a Sunday with something as important as this? And he goes, well, I know your guys' time off and your time together is very important. And I didn't, you know, I just, I hesitated in calling you. I stressed out and I'm like, thank you for that call. And when we, because of that call, when we dug in deeper, we found out the development company we had hired, who was supposed to be using all his in-house programmers, had actually pretty much outsourced everything to the cheapest places he could. And so all the viruses and all the back doors that were in the coding, and I'm our biggest thing is when with our app, is we want absolute people certainty that when they're writing in their journals, that no one, including us, can read it. That's how important mm. encryption is. And so, you know, from that call, we ended up basically, you know, firing the developer right away. And, you know, I brought my, you know, friend who, well, now like a family member, he had just been an investor at that time. And I said, Jason, I need you to come on the board of directors and really direct this because you understand how the coding works. And so we brought him in. He ended up doing a lot of fixes just to even put the first version out. And, you know, when we decided to start on version two, it was the decision was it's going to be easier and cheaper to start from scratch than to try to fix all the bugs yeah. in the first one. And so for the last couple of years, we've been coding out version two. We've now taken version one completely offline. We got it fixed enough that it was working well. And we got the most important thing, which was valuable insight from our users of what they were liking, what they weren't liking. So we could develop what we wanted to do different. And on version two, it, going to be so much more of an enhanced version, user-friendly, interactive, gamified. And, you know, I could get upset again looking back at that whole journey, but I look back and I go, had that not happened, we wouldn't have got some of the insights of where we're taking version two. So I'm actually, I feel blessed that we've gone through that part of the journey. Fantastic. And that's a big lesson as well when working with providers. I'm now... (laughs) One of the many things I'm doing at this point is teaching supply chain and, you know, having a good relationship and understanding and looking at the fit with your providers, with the people you work with in the rest of the supply chain. In this case, it was your developers is super important, super crucial. And I'm sure you learned that lesson. Maybe not the single hardest way (laughs) that you could have, but I'm sure it was, you know, it was a pretty tough moment for you finding out this, this had happened. Well, and with how much money had been already invested and spent and, you know, knowing we had to walk away from that because we knew we weren't going to get any of that money back. And of and course. then the choice comes to, do we, well, let me be clear, we could have if we decided to go to court and all that. And my mind went to, so where do I want to put my focus? On digging court. up and going through all this <laughs> crap or moving forward? And we yeah. chose to say it's more healthy and beneficial for us to move forward. Makes sense. <laughs> That's probably the, the 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 choice for the better because the time that you were investing in something like court, and I'm not saying don't go to court for anything, but uh, probably it was a time a lot better invested in creating something better. And yeah, even, and that you was know, even if you forgot the, the whole project, would have been more productive. Sorry? Yep. I said, and that was our choice in the moment based on, yep. and we look back and sometimes kick ourselves, but it was, that's where I've learned to have to, you know, to trust myself that in the moment when I make a decision, it was right in that moment. And with who I am and what I knew at that time, I did the best I could. So, cause it never yep. makes sense to look back and start beating myself up over things that I, a decision I made in the past It's like, how do I keep moving forward? Yeah, it's, I've, I've not, nothing related at all, but uh, it's like when they say, you know, looking back and, and trying to fix things in the past is what leads to, I think that's, yeah, the depression <laughs> and looking, doing the same thing, but into the future is what generates anxiety. So you want to try it. to be as present as possible. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> it. Which goes back to why, what we were talking about earlier, you know, my Zen teacher years ago, I was blessed to be, cause I didn't believe in that stuff. Let's be clear. <laughs> it was like, Zen, are you kidding me? That's too woo woo. But then as I started noticing the changes, little things, because it was being introduced in my life that it made, my wife and I ended up doing a four day Zen retreat of cheer silence, just meditating. And there was a question that was always bugging me in the back of my mind, Rob, that at night we could ask questions and I didn't have the courage to ask it, but another person did. And I'm so glad they did. They said to the teacher, they said, Sherry, you know, here in this surrounding, meditating is so much easier. 
But when I go home again, I don't have time to sit down for 20 minutes and go home and have total quiet. And I'm going to have kids bouncing off of me. How do I meditate when I'm home? And her answer actually changed my life. She said, meditation is simply being present. So if you're actually truly present in what you're doing in that moment. So like right now, I'm here having this conversation with you. So I'm actually not only have being able to add value to people's lives, have a great conversation with you, but I'm also meditating at the exact same time because my focus is on how present can I be in this moment. And because of that, my goal nowadays is how much during a day can I truly be present? And so, in fact, how much meditating am I doing every day? And I love that as a goal of mine because now when I'm at work, I'm at work. But when I'm with someone, I'm with them full on. And that's changed my life. Fantastic. Fantastic. Lots of insights there. Plenty of actionable feedback in all of that too. And actually, let's go for the 180 degree spin. Let's go for actually a time where, you know, maybe one of your trainings that you were, as you were mentioning before and using gamification in one of them, but a a challenge that you faced, something that happened and, and you wanted to overcome that challenge. And you used one of these strategies to overcome that challenge. We want to be there in that story and sort of live it with you once again and of course, take a few lessons or, or, or good practices from that. Well, as long as you don't mind me getting graphic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I found my passion and, you know, I, I went from struggling, my wife and I deep in financial debt and because of personal development allowed us not only create financial freedom, but it allowed me to find my passion, which was to teach others. And my goal has always been if I could even help one person do what my wife and I had um, done in the beginning, go from deep financial stress to financial freedom and make it all worthwhile. And of course, you know, today I've been blessed to have personally taught over half a million people around the world. But when I started training, I overlived my passion. And this may sound strange, overliving your passion. What does that mean? Because I found I love so much being able to help people in the first four and a half years as a trainer, I ended up doing 200 multi-day trainings around North America and then starting to go around the world where I was actually training and on stage because each training three to five days long or even six days long. And I'm on stage up to 12 hours a day teaching. I was living my passion so much. I was actually only at home on average two days a month. And I didn't realize I was getting burnt out. And the only reason it worked is my wife was running behind the scenes. I was on the stage. She was running the logistics and a small audience for us was a thousand, 1500, 2000 people at a time. And so we were traveling all over the place living life, but I was getting so burnt out, I didn't realize how bad. And I started having pains in my leg and the lower back, and I thought it was sciatic. And it came to a point in 2008 where I went, I've got to take a break and I need to take a year off. And when I decided to take that break, all of a sudden I found out I didn't have a sciatic problem. I'd actually herniated a disc because Ah. with all the standing on stage, I wasn't standing properly. I was putting most of my weight on my right leg. So I was torsioning my hips. And then with all the flying I was doing, I ended up herniating the disc. And I was having these episodes where it would take me out for up to a week at a time, where all of a sudden I would move the wrong way and it would drop me to the floor. And I couldn't move. The only thing I'd do is crawl to the nearest couch or bed and knew that I'd have to lay out for at least a week for me to be able to get mobile again. And it got to a point where all of a sudden I'm on the hiatus and it happened when we were visiting family. And all of a sudden a week went by and I wasn't getting better. And my wife's like, that's it. I've had enough. We're finding out what's wrong. And that's when, you know, through the going to emergency, we found out and getting an MRI, I found out I had herniated a disc. And, you know, in Canada, we have a good health system where we don't have to pay for our health system. That's the great side. But the downside is it could take forever to get an appointment. And so when the doctor, the neurosurgeon um, agreed to see me and I went into his office, he's like, yep, you've herniated your L4, L5. And at this point, it's now three weeks in. He said, so we can do a a minor day surgery called microdisectomy, but it's about six months out. Hmm. And I got to tell you, Rob, I have to wait six months. I emotionally just was in the wrong place. And I, you know, I'm at home now and I'm in bed and I can't get out of bed. And nothing humbles you more than when someone's got to wipe your ass because you can't. And that is humbling as can be. And I'm on so many painkillers and I'm thinking, how am I going to make it six months And we were about six, seven weeks in when all of a sudden I got a call from his nurse saying we had a cancellation on Thursday and two days from now, can you make it in? And I just broke down. 
and I emotionally, I just crumbled and I'm like, yeah. And at 7 a.m., I basically, in a lot of pain, walked in. At 1 p.m., I walked out standing straight for the first time in months and I felt so great. And I'm going to give your listeners some piece of advice here, Rob. If the doctor tells you to do something to make sure you recover properly, do it. Yeah. I didn't. And three weeks later, I re-herniated the same disc ah. and ended up in the hospital having to go for a second surgery. And it took three weeks before the inflammation went down enough that they could actually do the second surgery. And when I woke up from that second surgery, now I've got less than 20% of a disc left in my L4, L5. I woke up and I said, I'm never going through that again. I looked at the doctor. I said, whatever you tell me to do, I'm doing second. I looked at my wife. I said, whatever you tell me to do, I'm doing first. <laughs> mm. And and that started the recovery process. And And I had to deeply go back into, during that whole time, what I'd been teaching around the world about mindset, about how to stay focused. And gamification to me was a big part of that because I've always liked games. So I find if I don't keep when I, when I'm, how does that saying go for depression? Most people, unless it's a chemical imbalance, depression is caused by having too much focus on yourself. And mm-hmm. so when you're laying in bed 24 seven, all those weeks, my mind kept going back to, you know, how miserable my life was. And so one of the ways I would distract myself would be to, you know, play some of the games I could play, you know, on my phone or whatever to keep myself distracted and have great conversations with people that were still doing what I was doing before, because I knew their mindset would lift me up. And so I was, you know, I would spend hours on the phone as much as I could just talking to people to keep myself from being able to have the chance to go into my own mind. That makes a lot of sense. So thank you for that very, you know, very deep story, Robert. I think it must have been really, really harsh to to go through that. And hopefully, of course, you're taking good care of yourself right now. And that's not going to happen again. Like I said, that was in 2009. I went through those two surgeries and I'm like, I choose to not go through that again. And so I'm very aware of my body. I'm very aware of when, because I do get stiff and sore doing different activities. And and then that's where I stop because I choose also not to be on medication um, Mm. for it. And so I have become so aware of my body. I know what works for me, what doesn't. And if I, you know, am pushing it too much, when to stop, I make that decision instead of being that young person that goes into ego and goes, <laughs> I can fight through this. Yeah, wait till you're in your 50s and you'll be like, <laughs> why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great, Robert. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. And Robert, what would you say is, you know, is there a some sort of when, again, for t- drawing from your experience and, and doing gamification in your trainings, is there some sort of best practice, something that you would say, well, if you want to use this in your trainings, it's at least going to make them a little bit better or a lot better in either case? Yeah, as adding as many, you know, because coming from a trainer's perspective, and I want to be clear, I'm a trainer, I'm not a speaker, because, you know, and, and here's the subtle difference. A speaker, when you're on stage, you've got 45 minutes, an hour, whatever, and, and, and you're there just talking and delivering value. As a trainer, most of my courses are multi-days. And so because I do such long days, it's how much can I keep my audience involved? So what that means is because I really choose to use interaction and involvement with the audience... I can take about 25% of the data, what people would normally think they would need to fill up a time. And I actually put that into making it more impactful because I don't just speak and they hear. That's one way that people learn. But also now when you get them to do activities, whether it's writing things down, sharing with someone else, putting them into a process or a game, they get it on such a deeper level. So the best practice for me is how much can you put into gamifying your talk so that people truly get it. They actually ingrain it into the cells of their body because the, and I'll put it like this, your results and how your audience will perceive your training will be in direct proportion to the amount that you have them do. Anything you can have them do instead of you doing it for them, the better. And that to me is gamifying it in all sorts of ways. 
There you go. Putting people to do the thing, to do the practice. That is a fundamental thing to do whenever you want people to learn. I would say it's as yeah. fundamental as that for sure. It is. Like next week, in two days, I fly down to Florida to do my first live training in almost two years. And when I'm on the stage, I'm going to deliver some data on the first, I'm on stage twice. And you know, both times that I'm on stage, I'm going to have some form of game. So what I'll do is I'll deliver some data. I'll get them an understanding of it, but then I'm going to put them into groups where I'm going to put them into a game so that they actually experience what I just taught them. And it makes my job so much easier. People go, how can you do 12 hours on stage? Well, it's not just me talking the whole time. <laughs> I'm, and then, you know, I'm watching them play the games and getting the aha moments because they're figuring it out from their perspective instead of just taking my word for it. And then when they finish a game, I pull them out of the game and then we debrief their learnings to take it to an even deeper level. And then you see more light bulbs go off in people's eyes. It's, it's the greatest you know, way of doing trainings in my experience and in, in my perspective, my opinion. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And it is, you know, practicing what you preach for sure. And, you know, after going through this interview, we were discussing at the start, you know, before the interview, saying like, oh, yeah, I, you, you sort of like to, to keep it fresh and, you know, not prepare too much, which makes a lot of sense too. Is there somebody that you would like to listen to sort of going through an interview similar to this one in, in Professor Game? Somebody, you know, you think would make a great guest for a podcast like this one? Oh, if you haven't heard of him yet, I will definitely introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Clinton Swain. And nope, I don't know. I haven't if heard of him. Oh, oh, dude. Okay. So he is, from my experience, the foremost expert in gamifying anything, anything. He's developed probably 65 or more games that can anywhere from a uh, half an hour up to four day games. And when he does them and you go to one of his live events, as an example, he's got the costumes, he's got everything because you full on get into the game for the learning. Um, I'm going to be with him next week in Florida or this week in Florida because he's going to be teaching um, a, a specific piece of real estate using a game to play it. And for four hours at a time on two of the days, the students are actually going to learn more about this type of real estate investing than they will learn in weeks of reading in a manual. And when the pandemic hit, he took everything from live to virtual. And so his real estate game that he runs online for three intensive days got something like 85 Google Docs that go with it because everything <laughs> gets tracked. And again, people come out of three days of learning about real estate and there are greater real estate investors than people that have maybe even been doing it for years because of the games. And so I love and I will connect you with him because he will teach you the science of how to do a game, you know, what's important in games. He knows it down to the infinite detail. The man is amazing. Fantastic. Sounds like a great guest for the podcast for sure. And of course, lying right next to your best-selling book or books, actually. Is it, is it one or more? Uh, right now, I've got my one international best-selling book. I'm writing my second one um, right it. now as we speak. Yeah. So lying right next to that book and potentially in the future to your <laughs> second book, is there any book that you would recommend to the engagers? Yeah, I'm looking at one right now on my desk to my left that I'm currently rereading. And yes, I said that rereading because I read it again every couple of years to make sure. And it is called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Hmm. What is that book about? Well, one of the agreements, and this is the one that really changed my life, is one of the agreements is don't take anything personally. And it talks about the law of projection, how even when someone seems to be attacking you so personally with hatred or venom or anger that it actually has nothing to do with you. It actually has everything to do with the other person. But if you take their poison, bring it in, then it becomes your poison. And so it's really having the four agreements, critical agreements with yourself to be able to allow yourself to really live that life you want. You know, it's, it's a practical guide to personal freedom is the tagline or the subtitle of the book. And Don Miguel Ruiz, he wrote this book about 30 years ago. The man is just phenomenal, and he's impacted millions of people's lives around the world with this book. And so if you haven't heard of it, read it. It will change your life. Sounds like a, a, you know, a page turner for sure. Definitely. So thank you for that recommendation. And talking about recommendations, what would you say is your favorite game? <laughs> well, right now, because it does change, 
you know, it absolutely changes. And I'm actually playing a game as an app on uh, my phone called Fishdom. <laughs> and that's the game I'm playing, and which may not be the answer you were expecting, but I'll give a little kind of background to that. One of the things that I do is when I teach people, we talk, one of the things I teach people about is ego. And ego is natural, but most people that struggle, they go, I can't have ego. I don't have ego. I've got to deny I have ego. I've got to suppress the ego. And if you do that, it's going to come out in the weird ways. It's going to come out in times that you don't expect it. And so when I'm training on stage or I'm doing interviews or anything like that, my goal is what are the students getting out of it? To me, there's absolutely no room for ego whatsoever. But if I try to deny I have ego, that's when it's going to surface on me. So a number of years ago, I found that my greatest way, because you want to let your ego play in healthy ways. If you do that, then when you want to be out of ego, you can be more centered, you can be more heartfelt, you can be more present with people. And so I discovered years ago that the safest way for me to let my ego play is play video games. And so like if you and I, Rob, we're on going head to head on a video game, I'm sorry, dude, I like you, but you're going down because I'm going to be in that game to win. That's my goal, you know, and, and because that's where I can safely let that ego play and have fun. And so I like all different types of games. I love board games, playing, you know, Monopoly. I was just in Dubai in March and I brought back the Dubai version of it. And so my wife and I and family members, we play it as much as we can because I love board games or sorry, you know, we, this summer doing camping, my sister got me going on sorry. And so my wife and I've been playing that, you know, crib, we play that every single day. So if we go favorites, I'd say crib is my favorite because my wife and I, while we have lunch every day, we play a game of crib. Sounds like an all time favorite for sure. <laughs> Very clear winner in that sense. <laughs> and so like Robert, I, said, I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but <laughs> I, the answer I'm looking for is what is your favorite game, man? That's, that's entirely yeah. up to you for, you know, The, there, there's a saying in Spanish, para gustos los colores, you know, for, you know, for whatever you like, there's a, there's a color for every different person. And there's an infinite <laughs> amount of yeah, colors, so literally, true. if you're into colors. Um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm the, in that sense, I'm the classic, <laughs> classic man is like blue, green, yellow, <laughs> red, and, and not too much more than that so when they start saying, yeah. So what's your favorite game? Because I'm curious. My now. favorite game. Right now, I'm really, really, really enjoying playing um, in my PlayStation 4, Spider-Man, uh, the, the latest game that they had in play, PlayStation 4, before Miles Morales. I, I haven't gotten that one, that sort of the black Spider-Man. I haven't oh, gotten to that one God. yet because I want to finish this one. So, so that's, yeah. that's a challenge yet. Yeah, so it sounds like you and I have a lot in common. And I stay away from my, uh, you know, because I have all the different from, I haven't bought any of the newer PlayStations or, or Nintendos, but I have older systems and that. And because I do have a very addictive personality, that's one of the things <laughs> I realized is that if I start getting into those games, I will be on them for hours. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, 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 that's how I've learned to kind of why I stay to my phone as well, because then I can do a, like a two minute game, satisfy that, quiet the mind, you know, get that um, urge out and then get back to whatever, you know, I, I need to focus on in that moment. So <laughs> but now you got me curious there's, there's, and intrigued <laughs> there's many edges uh, onto that one for sure like I, i understand where you're where you're coming from but the other thing is also at least for me it's also a challenge and i'm facing it like currently <laughs> like oh, having games in your phone the problem is your phone is with you all the time hmm. right right so there, <laughs> there there is a possibility that you start saying oh how about i pull out my phone and just do those two minutes right yep and then you pull it out again And do those other two minutes, and you realize you've lost an hour, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so true. That's something to, that's be, to be to watch out for. Yeah, discipline comes in for there. And and when I teach success, that is, you know, a lot of people, it's about those little distractions yeah. that can turn into hours. And then yeah. they go, oh, wow. And they call it, then they call it procrastination. But it comes by many different names. And procrastination is one thing, but then sabotage is something totally different, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes you're just running away from something. And that's why you dive into the game so, so deeply. <laughs> you got it. So, Robert, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for, for being here with us. Is there any sort of final piece of advice, any final words you want to leave the engagers with? Of course, let us know where we can find out more about you, about your work, what you're doing, anywhere we can, I don't know, follow you or, or see what you're up to before we say that it's game over. 
<laughs> oh, womp, 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 womp. game over. No, you know, <laughs> I love the flow of this and I love how you've put the games around it. That's so awesome. And, you know, I'm absolutely, I'm on social media between Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can follow me there. But what I'd love to do, Rob, as a gift to your audience, see, I believe that our time is one of our most precious commodities. And the fact that you were gracious enough to invite me on your podcast means so much. And I totally appreciate that. And then the fact that your audience has taken the time to listen to my craziness. I so appreciate that as well. So as a gift, if they simply go to my website, which is my name, robertriopel.com. So just R-O-B-E-R-T-R-I-O-P-E-L.com. They're actually going to be able to download the entire digital version of my first international bestseller, Success Left a Clue, as our Ooh. gift to them. And now I will say, though, it does come with a caveat, my friend. It comes with a caveat. <laughs> See, I didn't write the book for people to read it and put it on the shelf and make it shelf help. That doesn't do anybody any good. So because I cover six steps and the third step to success is taking action, I actually wrote it as a workbook. And so there's action steps all the way through it. And I'll even say after an action step, I'll actually say, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading right now. Go back, <laughs> do that action first before you read more because I know people are creatures of habit. And I'm going to make a promise to your listeners. If they take the time to download the book, read it, and do the action steps, I promise their life will go to a whole new level in the game. They will level up. I guarantee it. And so that I would love for them to do that and then leave them with these words. You know, always live with passion. They're the, word, the way I sign every autograph and every email because to me, passion is what really fuels us. So find what you're passionate about and live with that passion. That sounds very passionate. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again, Robert, for, for joining us today. It was a lot of fun having this interview. However, engagers, you know this as well. At least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it is absolutely fantastic to have you around because this podcast really makes sense with you. So why don't we go ahead and connect on Twitter? That way you can we can be in straight communications you will see what I'm publishing and you can find my Twitter account very easily. Just go to professorgame.com slash Twitter. I'm always sharing content on gamification, especially things related to the podcast and education. And before you click continue, remember to subscribe, to follow absolutely for free using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. <laughs>